All right, hello and welcome to the 25th annual George Mason Law Review Antitrust Symposium, celebrating 25 years of antitrust. We're excited to have you with us today to kick off our final day of the week-long event. My name is Carly Veeding, and I am the symposium editor of the George Mason Law Review. Before we get started with today's program, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has made this year's symposium possible. First and foremost are our generous sponsors, Freshfields and Charles River Associates. We deeply thank them for their ongoing support of the symposium. I thank everyone who had a hand in planning today's event, especially Professor Wright and Judge Ginsburg for their guidance, the Global Antitrust Institute staff for organizing all aspects of the symposium over the past year, and Carlos Sandoval for saving the day with his IT wisdom. We thank our vendors, Zoom Events and Five O'Clock Films, and Andre Stella Roche for making this virtual event possible and accessible. Finally, and most importantly, the symposium's participants. This event has a tradition of providing a forum for robust debate over the developing topics in antitrust law, and our panelists and speakers make this happen. Thank you to everyone who donated their valuable time and ideas to the symposium. The Law Review sees so much value in the foremost experts sharing their ideas, and it is a pleasure to play a role in bringing these discussions to the public. We have a fantastic program lined up, and I know everyone is eager for our keynote address. Thank you to Professor Bill Kovacic for joining us today. I'm very pleased to turn it over at this time to Professor Joshua Wright, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Professor Wright is University Professor and Executive Director of the Global Antitrust Institute at Scalia Law. Before rejoining the Scalia Law faculty in 2015, he served as Commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission. Professor Wright. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our 25th annual George Mason Law Review Antitrust Symposium. Uh, we have, as Carly mentioned, a great jam-packed schedule today uh, uh, with some fantastic speakers. Uh, and I've got the great pleasure uh, to introduce our keynote to get us started. First, let me double down on, on Carly's thank yous. I, uh, I want to thank Carly first, Carly Veeding, uh, from the George Mason Law Review, who uh, made uh, through her Herculean efforts uh, to transform our symposium from a one day in person event to a week long online and sort of ending with this full day uh, Friday event has just uh, been fantastic. Uh, Jen Falver from the George Mason Law Review, its editor in chief, uh, my, my own staff at GAI, uh, Amanda Olsofsky, Daniel Tonsing, uh, for putting uh, this event together. Uh, can't thank them enough. Uh, we certainly couldn't do it with any of, without any of their help, uh, and we hope you join us for the panels throughout the day. With our 25th uh, Antitrust Symposium, there is uh, just no better way to get started uh, than uh, to have Bill Kovacic put all of uh, the developments over the past 25 years, uh, and in particular to do it here at George Mason. There's just no better way uh, than to have Bill start us off. Uh, any of you on uh, attending the symposium, uh, rarely is it ever true when someone starts an introduction by saying the person needs no introduction, but in an antitrust symposium at George Mason, uh, that, that certainly is the case with Bill. I'm gonna introduce him anyway. Uh, Bill is the Global Competition Professor of Law and Policy and the Director of the Competition Law Center at the George Washington University. Uh, you all likely do know uh, also that Bill from 2006 to 2011 was a member of the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, both as commissioner and acting chair, uh, and was the FTC's general counsel from June 2001 to December 2004. You may not know uh, that during that time, uh, excuse me, that previously in Bill's career, uh, before joining GW in 1999, he was the George Mason University Foundation Professor uh, right, right here at GMU Law. Uh, he is also a, a, a great friend and mentor, uh, a co-author of the best case book in all of the land. <laughs> um, but despite his affiliation with me through the case book in George Mason, uh, please don't hold that against him. Um, Bill also uh, was the recipient of the 2011 FTC Miles Kilpatrick Award. So without further ado, it is a great pleasure uh, to hand the floor over to Bill to get us started today. 
Bill, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, I can't think without emotion about the pleasure of participating in the program and joining in a symposium that in the last quarter century has established itself as an unsurpassed forum for the discussion of competition policy issues. There are other good ones around the world, but nobody is better. And to reflect on how the law review with the symposium has enhanced the stature of George Mason as an unsurpassed intellectual hub in the larger framework of competition law is something remarkable to behold. And what I'm going to do today is to, to draw upon much of what I learned as a member of the faculty uh, in my collaboration with Josh and uh, in, in, in writing on the case book, uh, in my work with Tim Muris, who was my colleague at George Mason for so many years before he invited me to join the FTC as its general counsel, uh, to reflect on a number of themes that have been indispensable, I think, to the development of a broader conception of competition law and to apply them uh, in the context of current efforts uh, within the Biden administration to expand the reach of competition law and policy. I want to talk about the way in which the Biden administration might seek to change the framework for competition law enforcement, in addition to changing the basic content of doctrine and policy. You're familiar with the great upheaval that has taken place in the policy domain captured on this coffee cup. And you're also aware of how President Biden last summer uh, gave his own imprimatur to a sweeping realignment of competition law and policy by signing his executive order on competition policy and promoting a government of the whole approach to applying competition law and policy. Part of what I did in my time at George Mason was to become reacquainted with not just the challenges of designing doctrine, but the great emphasis that so many of my colleagues brought to bear on the question of policy implementation. And here again, I think of the many conversations I had at George Mason with Tim Muris, who had not only had a major hand in shaping the way we think about competition law and policy, but Tim had actually gone to make theory meet practice. And it is captured in an earlier text, a classic in political science from Graham Allison, uh, about the way in which we tend to overlook the problem of implementation. Uh, Allison observed that if we're gonna do a better job in public policy, we have to think about how to cross the path between a preferred solution and the actual performance of government. In another formative public administration text from a slightly later period, uh, Neustadt and May observed that in formulating prudent approaches to governance of agencies, we try to build what they called canny judgments about feasibility of the contemplated courses of action. And Neustadt and May posed three questions that I can see here again and again from conversations with Tim. Uh, will it work? Will it stick? Will it help more than it hurts? Three basic admonitions to policymakers in deciding what to do next. And today I want to focus on these questions. Uh, in my earlier life before becoming an academic, uh, I spent lots of time with what was then known as the McDonnell Douglas Company. And I spent lots of time talking to engineers who'd worked on the US space program. The engineers explained to me that the physics of going to the moon and bringing people back safely was relatively clear, some very fancy math, uh, some computational issues, but the basic concept of how to do it was relatively clear. What was very hard was the engineering to make it, to make it so, uh, how to send humans back and forth safely, the basic technology to do that when Jack Kennedy announced that that's what we were gonna do in 1961, by the end of the decade, that technology for the most part didn't exist. The engineering part was very difficult indeed. And I wanna talk about today about uh, how well one is going about building the institutional infrastructure to carry out reform. Uh, and I wanna talk about the enabling environment today that makes the discussion of institutions, uh, I think a, a keen and timely topic to talk about reform possibilities and the obstacles to doing it. I'm giving you my views only. I'm still a member of the 
board of the UK's Competition and Markets Authority. I don't speak for them, but I certainly do draw upon my own experiences there. Uh, and I also have a stake in this debate uh, from my own personal experience. Uh, you're familiar with the modern literature that is harshly critical of US competition policy from the early 1980s up to the arrival of the Obama leadership and the agencies. The milder versions of that critique simply say that we made a lot of mistakes. The harsher ones uh, referred to the people in question as being faintly idiotic, if not corrupt. Uh, that's not the way I like to think about my own time in government, either my motives or my effectiveness. Uh, but I put that aside as best I can to understand better the nature of what the reform advocates are seeking to do and what they face in trying to carry that out. And indeed, what they might do during their time in office, it would actually make the system better by improving its institutional framework. And in so many ways, the themes I'm drawing on, you can see in the pages of the annual symposium going back to its earliest days, where you see an interesting mix, not only of commentators talking about the, what competition policy should do, the substance, but how to do it, how to go about situating specific reforms ideas in the difficult po policy environment that confronts anyone seeking to actually make things take root and to last, and indeed to work well. There's a gathering storm that's been documented in many ways in earlier issues, and a lot of it deals with the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, uh, the decision by the Supreme Court in AMG Capital to reject the FTC's argument that Section 13B of the FTC Act authorized the agency to seek equitable monetary relief, a 9-0 decision. The last time the FTC uh, faced a shutout on the losing side of a Supreme Court decision was 1931. Uh, the Axon case, which the Supreme Court has chosen to take, on what in some sense is a narrow procedural issue, but it goes in many ways to the heart of the operation of the administrative adjudication mechanism at the FTC. And I can't imagine that the court took the case to reject the claimant's position about how the claimant should have the opportunity to go directly to the federal district court to challenge the constitutionality of the FTC's process. And I'm suspecting that the opinion written by the Supreme Court will not have a lot of good things to say about the FTC and its operations. Uh, current enthusiasm for doing competition rulemaking and relying on 6G of the FTC Act, relying very heavily on a 1973 decision of the US Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, that's the National Petroleum Refiners case, a case uh, whose best if used by date may have expired. If not, they passed its actual expiry date as well. Uh, a crucial question is, if you try to run major competition rulemaking proceedings on the basis of that decision, will the reasoning of the court from 50 years ago hold up today? Um, the role of the FTC in performing the role that Daniel Crane, University of Michigan, is called norms creation and using Section 5 of the FTC Act to do that. Um, a longtime vision of the agency in many ways that motivated its creation uh 107 years ago uh yet uh in that 107 year history uh a distinct minimum of success in making it work why is it going to be different this time arguably in the face of a judiciary that's more skeptical about the broad elastic application of grants of authority justice Breyer's retirement from the supreme court uh unquestionably our unparalleled expert in the field of administrative law on the court, the supreme authority on the Supreme Court uh, about antitrust law, and I would say the best friend the FTC has on that court now leaving. Uh, his successor might be more sympathetic than some of her new colleagues are to government intervention in the economy, uh, but her successor will unlikely bring, and, and indeed no one could quite bring, uh, the unparalleled expertise that Justice Breyer has, and I think his deep sympathy for the FTC, though he was the author of the majority opinion, the unanimous majority opinion in AMG Capital. Uh, his favorable perspective on the whole for the FTC will be missing as other matters come about. And we're probably going to see comprehensive privacy reform, which is going to face Congress with the question of where that mandate goes, 
Does the FTC inherit it? Or does the creation of the mandate provide an occasion to spin off the competition portfolio down to the Department of Justice and transform the FTC into an omnibus consumer protection authority, which also does privacy, uh, a fundamental restructuring of the agency, which forces the agency, I think, to argue, to think about why having competition, consumer protection, and privacy under the same roof makes sense. The big issues for the FTC uh, that could provoke a basic reassessment of its structure and function of the institutional framework for US policymaking um, is to define what the remedial mandate should be. The original vision in 1914, 1915 was that you would have an agency with very light touch remedies, but the power to adjust doctrine and policy, especially through the application of section five of the FTC Act, informed by its unique research capabilities embedded in section six of the FTC Act, Another key question is whether jurisdictional carve outs for common carriers, not for profits, for banks created in the early 20th century will carry on. Are we happy with the FTC's governance structure? Uh, I participated in the CMA's monthly meeting for the month of February on Wednesday. And in nine years of sitting on board meetings, going back to the shadow period before the CMA was reconstituted. Um, in 2014, uh, I can only say that compared to the sterile and generally uninformative discussions that take place at the FTC, even in their new public format, to compare that to the very rich discussions that take place at the CMA is a striking difference. And the CMA is so far ahead in using its board as an effective governance mechanism in ways that the FTC cannot obtain, has not attained, and maybe never will. Can that governance framework be made more effective, again, by comparison to what others have done? Uh, the future of administrative adjudication at the FTC. If we focus on, again, Dan Crane's measure of performance, the norms creation function, and the FTC's had 107 years to do this, what are the top 10 contributions to competition law? that go beyond the interpretation of either the Clayton Act or the Sherman Act. What are the 10 greatest hits? Can you even come up with 10? Where section five of the FTC Act has made a distinctive contribution. And I'm thinking not so much just by settlements, although I'll take those too, but through the adjudication of cases that result in favorable assessments by the courts of appeals. I'd suggest to you that's a hard list to come up with. And because it's very hard to do, in 107 years, I suppose you could hope that the second century would be better, but one is forced to ask why so few positive results in the previous century and a few years. And last, as I mentioned before, uh, what's the appropriate combination of functions? The FTC was conceived initially to be just an antitrust, a competition agency. Consumer protection makes its way in immediately as a way of ensuring that dishonest advertisements did not divert trade away from honest merchants. And now the emergence in, since the late 60s with the Fair Credit Reporting Act of the privacy portfolio. What's the logic of having them all together? I think there is a logic, but the FTC is going to have to demonstrate that the integration of these policy domains provides a better outcome than one would achieve if they were separately organized. Otherwise, the FTC becomes simply a conglomerate manager of distinct operations that has no specific superior ability to manage those assets and use them well. And the key question will be, where will Congress put the privacy portfolio? Will it go to the FTC? If it does, probably with two to 300 additional work years, when you look at the pie chart of the FTC budget after you expand the privacy portfolio, you end up with a relatively small slice that's called antitrust. And when you look at it, it becomes easy to say, why is it here? Why don't we just move it down to the Department of Justice? So the FTC, in thinking about elaborating its program, is going to be confronted with the question of why we give you and continue to sustain the allocation of authority that you have now. 
And there's pressure, I think, to rethink the US framework because of what's going on abroad. In the last 15 years, one public agency after another that had a duality of functions at the national level has given it up. Just a few, China, France, Spain, United Kingdom, all unified their enforcement framework at the federal level into a single agency. Many foreign agencies have achieved what I would say is superior intellectual leadership in the way in which they have spurred the development of the debate, conducted research that shapes the debate, published reports and studies that shapes, in the debate, shapes the debate. I would not have said 10 or 15 years ago that that change had taken place. I'm convinced that it has now. Others have explored the development of better policy tools. I'm quite a fan of what the United Kingdom's done with its markets regime. The US has one, but it doesn't have the remedial features that the UK does. As I mentioned before, I think other agencies are getting much more mileage in using their governing boards to do what a board ought to do, broad strategic vision, discussion of surrounding circumstances and changing in circumstances, identification of priorities, allocation of resources, and a continuing discussion about what the high ground for policymaking ought to be. And in this respect, I would say that the competition of markets authority is unsurpassed in the world at doing that. It's not just because I've been there, though I like to think that I had something to say about how to approach that, that, that condition. But the CMA does these things very well in a way that compares, I think, most unfavorably to what's taken place at either the FTC or in some ways at the Department of Justice. Our agencies that used to lead the field are no longer doing so. And how do you regain that position of influence? I think improving governance, certainly at the FTC, is a crucial step in that direction. What are the reform possibilities? That is, what could current management do in this period of possible change that would provide, I think, a stronger basis for policymaking? We are familiar with their bold policy proposal. But what could they do to put the institutional framework on a better footing than it is now? to ensure that not only their own programs, but the programs of their successors proceed better. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of possibilities. Deeper cooperation among the relevant policymakers, that's partly implicated in the whole of government approach that the Biden administration announced in the executive order. I think a very healthy approach to unifying disparate areas of policymaking and realizing their connections, what government agencies could do, especially as the Biden executive order said, by removing unnecessary barriers to access to the market, to facilitate entry and growth by smaller and newer firms, and to get unnecessary restrictions that may be the product just of anachronistic inertia or the product of effective special interest pleading to get those out of the way. Better agency disclosure of what our agencies are doing and an enhanced evaluation regime. I'll talk a bit about each of these as steps that could improve the foundations of US policymaking in a durable way. There's a keen interest in current leadership of increasing litigation as a tool of policymaking. Uh, Jonathan Cantor, the AAG, earlier this year, a month ago, we need new published opinions from the courts. We need to be willing to take risks and ask the courts to reconsider the application of old precedents in new markets. Joel Klein uh, in the 1990s during his tenure uh, as AAG also emphasized the importance of using litigation to carry out what he called a conversation with the courts. Litigation is going to be harder than one might think from the outside, especially if you're an academic, as I used to comment on different cases. There's nothing easy about it. Tim Wu, who's now in the White House, uh, in an earlier comment about the FTC's Facebook case, this is a straightforward and easy case. A interesting custom I've observed in the United Kingdom is that when you have confronted what you think is a doubtful proposition, there are more vulgar and non-creative forms of expression you could use, but the more polite but still penetrating UK inquiry is to say, really? Really? Are there any straightforward and easy cases dealing with Section 2 of the Sherman Act? Easy, straightforward? A key question is, will the Department of Justice and the FTC 
take a truly integrated approach to devise and carry out a litigation strategy that's going to change the doctrinal framework that is not welcoming at the moment to expansions in the reach of public intervention. A joint venture, a genuine joint venture between the two agencies has never been realized. You've had as needed cooperation, effective cooperation on different matters, such as drafting merger guidelines. But for the most part, you have never had the two agencies sit down together and say, what are the boundaries of doctrine now? Where do we want to make desired extensions? What are the obstacles to doing it? And how do we both go about doing that with a common strategy? There's a moment now where that could happen. Uh, I suggest you go back and look at Jonathan Kander's comments on the day that he and FTC Ch Chair Lena Khan rolled out the announcement of the public consultation on merger guidelines. Look at AAG Cantor's opening statement and look at the first couple of paragraphs. I have never heard or read of an AAG speaking so generously, so kindly, and so positively about FTC leadership or the FTC's contribution to policymaking. And I think he believes it. As an alumnus of the FTC, as someone who worked in the engine room as a case handler, I think he believes that. And I think you see in his statement a, a genuine understanding that unless the FTC and the DOJ work together and see their common cause in building a larger strategy, they will not attain their ends. And that includes, I think, building a common research agenda as the basis for bringing cases, developing a program of secondments, having common teams for shared areas of interest like tech, like mergers, and ask in a very non-sentimental and harsh way, how many major cases can we run successfully at one time? And doing this involves a sharp historical awareness, not the use of history basically to write advocacy pieces where you select as a lawyer selects precedents they like, the partner says, find me a case that says, instead of saying, tell me what the law is, a historical awareness that asks in a very honest way, what worked before and why did it work? What failed and why did it come short? And a key example to study is the FTC from the 1970s where we had a major demand for transformation, a bolder transformation of the FTC, I would argue, than is taking place now. The ABA Blue Ribbon Report in 1969 said the FTC ought to leave behind all of the clear-cut cases and focus its competition resources on cases involving big commercial stakes, footnote, big commercial opponents, and unsettled areas of the law, footnote, that's where you're in greatest danger of being rebuked in the, in the appellate process. So do big cases involving novel applications of doctrine. And by 1977, the FTC had done lots of that, indeed, on the competition and consumer side of the house. I've given you a short litany, and I assure you it is a subset of the major cases they brought involving shared dominance, involving predatory pricing, involving distribution practices, involving the role of professional societies in restricting competition through ethical codes. And by 1977, the FTC was running 15 consumer protection rules under the Magnuson Moss framework. A sobering part of that experience is to realize that the management tools and staffing needs to do this well were not really created until the late 1970s too late to set these on the right path. So as you're thinking about adding new things to the mix, do you have a good match between your commitments and capabilities? You've promised to do a lot, but if you don't study this experience carefully to make sure there is a pretty good fit between what you've said you're going to do, what you're trying to do, and your ability to do it, you'll have a painful number of failures that will dishearten your staff and will undermine the effectiveness of your larger program. There are lots of things in the past that are worth a look. To look at how the FTC and DOJ did collaborate in doing a research program that fed into DOJ cases in the 40s and early 50s. The case management 
that DOJ brought to the Microsoft case in the 1980s. You probably saw that earlier this week, the FTC has said it's ready to go to trial in the Facebook case. It wants a trial date in late 2023. Facebook saying early 2024. That means no decision at the district court level until 2025. A trip to the to the up to the to the DC Circuit 2025. Maybe the Supreme Court in 2026. Is that a system fit for purpose? And in Microsoft, the DOJ brought its complaint in May of 1998. It, the trial began in October of 1998. What's going on in these other cases that makes the elaborated timetable necessary? Is there nothing to learn from what the DOJ did with the Microsoft case? Put smaller cases in the portfolio. Lorraine Journal, Otter Tail, Polygram. In isolation, you might shrug your shoulders and say, who cares? These were the vehicles for significant adjustments in doctrine that became building blocks. The FTC's part three masterpiece in Hospital Corp in the 1980s, Terry Calvani's masterful opinion for the FTC that gained the consent of Judge Posner and his colleagues on the Seventh Circuit. Nobody who writes a part three opinion for the commission should not study that decision carefully as a model for how you gain deference, not as a matter of form, but in reality. The way that the FTC restored effective hospital merger control in the 2000s. Tamiris's strategy of saying, we lose them all. How do we recover? We do research to test the predicates for the unfavorable decisions. We do our own whole of government approach where the FTC works with HHS to build a better data set that can be used to challenge mergers. And by the second half of the decade, it was working and it becomes a credible mechanism for enforcement. And oh yes, to study how equity concerns have not been absent in earlier antitrust cases. The FTC South Carolina State Board of Dentists case, the opinion written by Moselle Thompson for the commission talks on page one about how the beneficiaries of the challenge to unnecessary state restrictions on dental care, fluoride treatment for poor public school districts would have a massive distribution impact, a positive one on the parents of children in relatively poor school districts. It's not as though the FTC has never thought about it. What kinds of cases might you bring that fit within a more traditional framework to carry out your objectives? And last, if you're thinking about how to get to the Supreme Court and win with something good, you have to look at your experience the last time the FTC or DOJ appeared before the Supreme Court as a party in a Sherman Act Section 2 case, Otter Tail, 1973. Yeah, also 50 years ago, the federal agencies have been before the Supreme Court as friend of the court, amiki. When was the last FTC victory in the Supreme Court in a Section 2 case? That would be never. That's over 107 years. Maybe the second century will be better. But as you proceed with the Facebook case, which is a monopolization case, you have to think very carefully about why have all of our planes crashed in the past? Why hasn't it worked? And Supreme Court Section 2 jurisprudence since 1973, it's all been in the context of private cases. All private cases that stated concerns about over-deterrence through private rights of action. Is there a way to convince the court that those concerns are overstated and that the federal government, when it comes into court, stands on a different footing with different aims, different motivations? I'm going to go to what stands in the way of doing this. Uh, that is what gets in the way of making this work and work effectively. And I'm a big fan of the approach that's embodied in the whole of government executive order a number of things that I've talked about so far you can do without legislation, just better, deeper policy integration between the FTC and the DOJ. There are other things that require congressional change, just a few. Well, this is what Congress has talked about, more money for the agencies, but they've been talking about it now for coming up on two years and have done nothing. Will we see from all the legislative proposals a sweeping makeover of doctrine in the antitrust system? I think that's unlikely. We are more likely to see a targeted measure, maybe two, that deals simply with tech. 
which means that generally in the larger framework of policymaking, you're still going to have to earn what you want to get through the courts, which is why the common strategy is so important. And one thing that Congress has to confront is the resource and capability issue. It is, yes, a matter of adding more people in some areas. You can't run a truly nationwide effective privacy program with, a, with basically 60 work years. Absurd. You need the right skills. The CMA has built a tech team, a quant team that is 50 people now, computer scientists, specialists in data analytics, whose job it is to understand what's going on out in the marketplace and to bring the modern tools of analytics to bear on policymaking within the CMA. 50 people, nobody else is close. How many of these types do the DOJ or the FTC have now? Are they gonna get more? And the compensation problem uh, for quite a while, going back to earlier contributions to the Law Review Symposium, I have suggested that unless you improve the wages paid to skilled personnel, you will be chasing forever in a losing, losing race. If we can give the CFPB a 20, 25% boost over the pay scale for the rest of the government, is consumer financial protection so much more important? Is competition law not so much important? If this compensation issue is not addressed, we will always have a severe constraint on capacity to run hard matters because the revolving door will take people away because the wage differential is so great. Do you find other ways to make up the difference with generous loan forgiveness, student loan forgiveness policies? I'm simply going to say that you will not assemble and maintain the teams you need to run hard matters unless you're willing to pay for it. That is a built-in inherent constraint on capacity. And it's a real measure of the sincerity of Congress about all its reform commitments. If, there, if Congress is gonna say that's just too hard, I'm gonna say it's just too hard to carry out the more ambitious program. A Couple of closing comments on why this will all be hard to do. Uh, well, one problem is it takes a lot of time. Are you gonna be able to sustain a commitment to do this over the number of years that you'll need to do it? And can you overcome the side effects of the catastrophe narrative that I'll mention in a moment? If you look at the big policy reforms that take place, took place during the Reagan era, they took a long time. The Republicans had 12 years to appoint judges, to appoint leadership, to change the culture of the agencies. How many elections will it take? How many election victories will it take to move policy and the institutions in another direction. It's my own sense that incumbent leaders of agencies, when they realize how little time they have, tend to focus on the substantive program and not the institutional reforms. And indeed, you don't have much time. Average AAG tenure since 1933, about 2.7 years. Average FTC chair tenure since 1950, 3.3. The clock is ticking, it goes so fast. Are you going to have a succession of leaders with shared values to do it? How many elections are you gonna to win to carry out your program? Those considerations weigh against spending a lot of your time on the kind of institutional changes that I have in mind, even the deeper integration between the FTC and the DOJ. The catastrophe narrative. How do you make the case for sweeping change? You make it by saying everything that's there is rubbish that it's all falling apart. This is an unfortunate part of our political discourse. It preceded the transformation in 1981. It preceded the transformation in 69 and 70. And it certainly preceded the transformation that's taking place now, the attempted transformation. President Biden joined on this in his statement accompanying the executive order. 40 years ago, he chose the wrong path misguided philosophy, bork the bad guy, pulled back on enforcing the laws, 40 year of ex experiment and the experiment failed. Really, all bad, nothing to learn there that's good. Well, there's the bad guy, but the recent accomplice, so oh, it's Obama. Where does he get called out in a variety of publications in which 
Those who demand more robust enforcement attack the Obama era. Matt Stoller on Twitter early last year. The worst people in the Obama administration were the antitrust enforcers. Total failures and completely unashamed. Mind you, that's talking about the Obama era. That's not talking about the Bush people before. And a large body of commentary says it's not just bad agencies, it's really bad people. Tepper and Hearn, part of the loud chorus of authors who've attacked the modern enforcement program, can't help but end their commentary about the FTC and DOJ with a pretty harsh personal slur. By the way, who'd ever want to work for these agencies? Who'd ever want to be part of such a dismal, dismal history? Bad people, bad agencies, bad motives. What happens if you take this on? Well, are you going to learn anything from the past experience? Why should I study the past if it's all been a disaster? And yes, if you talk this way, how do you motivate your staff now and get them to commit themselves to an aggressive program to work really hard to basically do private sector hours for public sector wages if they've just been told that everything they did for the last 40 plus years was useless. And you're creating unattainable expectations about how you'll make it all better. You can make it somewhat better, but you don't have time to make it all better in your own vision. And you forget about how during this wasteland period, a lot of good things happen. Microsoft, Hospital Corp, h and Block, Polygram, Realcom, South Carolina State Board of Dentists, Three successful trips to the Supreme Court in the teens. How to design rules. Do not call. How to formulate programs with broad economic payoffs and broad social benefits. The DOJ procurement initiatives. Is this all trash? Not worth a look? Compare that to the real Steiger cooperation in the early 19, late 80s and early 90s on technical assistance abroad. They developed a view that said we needed a nonpartisan orientation when we dealt with other countries. We'd ask them what they thought they needed. When they asked, we would give them options. And when they wanted a normative prescription, we'd give it to them. But the aim was not to proselytize. The aim was to say, what do you need? What do you want? You want our views about what's good on the menu? We'll give them to you. But we will honestly tell you what's on the menu and what we think is better or not. This was a key element of the past program that unfolded during the era of neglect, the era of failure. Why does it matter? Uh, that's, uh, those are the wonderful golden domes of Kiev where the US ran a major technical assistance program from the mid 1990s onward, including till recently when it drew its people out because of the pending invasion. This is a meeting in 2019 in Kiev the woman in the foreground is Daria. She was the chief economist of Ukraine's anti-monopoly committee. She's gone to a consultancy since. And the man with the headphones is Sharunas Karaskauskas. Sharunas is a member, uh, is the head of Lithuania's competition commission. Both major recipients of US assistance over time. Well, this doesn't help you win a case at home, but do you think that's important? Is that all part of the bad old days and we're not going to do it anymore? Or is that something worth doing now? So three thoughts about the future. Durable commitment to the whole government approach. That's really worth doing. Deeper FTC, DOJ policy integration, realizing the true benefits of complementarity. That's worth doing. And yes, a durable commitment to the rest of the world now more than ever. Thank you. I know that I learned so much from your keynote and I really appreciate um, your contribution to this symposium and, and to the discussion in antitrust law. Um, we are about to start um, our first panel of the day, proposals to change the antitrust laws. Um, to our audience and attendees, if you are interested in joining um, the first panel of the day, please um, go back to the lobby and then you'll, this slide here illustrates where to go. Go back to the lobby and then enter our um, our first panel. Uh, thank you again, Professor. I, it, it's been a pleasure working with you, and I really think that our audience enjoyed your keynote. So thank you. Pleasure's all on my side, Carly. Thank you.